Hi, my name is Mark. I'm a neurosurgeon and a stem cell biologist. And over the past 10 years, I've become an entrepreneur. I'd like to start telling you about my work as a neurosurgeon. My focus on spinal cord injuries. When someone breaks their neck in a car accident, there's a high likelihood that their spinal cord is damaged. The trauma disrupts the neural tissue, nerve cells and their connections are lost, as well as the surrounding support cells. This can result in immediate paralysis and loss of neurological function. As a neurosurgeon, I'm called after the patient arrives in the emergency room and the injury is confirmed on imaging. My job is to manage the next steps. Many of my patients require urgent surgery. I use state-of-the-art navigation systems to place screws, like this one, into the bony structures surrounding the spinal cord. This stabilizes the spine, but it doesn't repair the neurological injury. The spinal cord is unable to regenerate the nerve cells that were lost in the injury and their connections. Most of my patients therefore remain paralyzed, unable to use their hands or walk, and some of them are even unable to breathe on their own. In fact, I realized that many of the conditions that I face as neurosurgeon, whether they're cancers, genetic, or degenerative conditions require more than a scalpel and screws. And they can't be treated successfully with conventional drugs either, because they, they require the regeneration of lost cells. What we need is a revolution in medicine, a new set of sophisticated interventions that, are, that can help these most difficult medical problems. We need to move from small molecules and biologics to a new generation of intelligent therapies, drugs that can interact with their environment. In other words, cell therapies. The good news is that this revolution is already on its way. The first cell therapies have been approved. Genetically engineered immune cells are starting to transform the treatment of cancer. As you can see on this video, these so-called CAR T cells are able to identify tumor cells and kill them. A meta-study investigating 27 CD19 CAR T cell therapy studies showed that 54.4% of patients experienced a complete response of their blood cancer. CAR Ts work when all other medicines have failed. I believe that these astonishing results are only the beginning, the first wave of cell therapies. And they give me hope when I think about the number of patients that I have operated on suffering from brain cancer. Like all tumors, their condition starts with a small number of brain cells turning rogue. And these cells are extremely good at escaping surgical tools, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. Today, there's very little that we can offer these patients, despite all the technical progress in neurosurgery. Their life expectancy is only about two years. My hope is that CAR-T and other cell therapies will be similarly transformative for these patients. Or, for example, take the young boys suffering from Duchenne's muscle dystrophy, a horrible condition in which their muscle cells start to die due to a mutation in a specific gene. This leads to progressive muscle weakness and puts them into wheelchairs. And the condition progresses until breathing becomes difficult. What their muscles need are healthy muscle cells. Again, a problem that is best addressed with cell and gene therapy, but so far, there are none. And what about the cell transplants for Parkinson's that have shown promising early effects a decade and more ago? Why is there still no treatment? Why is it so difficult to get cell therapies into the clinic? When it comes to cells, there's a manufacturing crisis. Cells are not easily accessible, Products are inconsistent and not scalable. This is why today there are only a handful of cell therapies and why they cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for 
a single patient. The lack of a reliable source of human cells also holds back scientific discovery and the development of more traditional drugs. To make cells available to everyone and to treat other conditions, we need to manufacture cells at industrial scale. So where do we get cells for cell therapy? All cell types start as stem cells, which then go on to create all the cells in our bodies. If you want to use cells for therapy, you can either take them from people, which is difficult, and in some cases not possible at all, or you can try and coax stem cells into the right cell type, which after 20 years of research we know is also very difficult. Stem cell biologists study embryonic development in order to obtain cues of how stem cells can be turned into the cell types required for drug testing, therapies, and research. This approach has two problems. It means that you have to follow developmental timelines, and these are long. Babies require nine months until they're born. And the approach is inconsistent because it is based on stochastic events. In order to reach a particular cell type, stem cells have to undergo multiple steps of differentiation in which they produce slightly more specific cells. This is a complex process. At each of these steps, cells need to make cell fate choices. They choose which cells they actually produce next, and these choices are based on chance events. During development, this ensures that really all cell types are generated and the growing organism doesn't miss a cell, or, or a tissue, or even an organ. The particular cell that we wanted to generate in my lab was a human oligodendrocyte. These are support cells in the brain that form insulating layers around the processes of nerves. They facilitate rapid conduction of nerve impulses and provide nutrient support. They are an ideal cell for repairing certain brain and spinal cord conditions. When we started out 10 years ago, the best protocol required more than 170 days of culture, during which we would feed and observe the cells, change culture conditions, add new molecules, wait until the cell responded, then again change the media containing a new set of molecules, and so on, until we finally saw some oligodendrocytes emerging. However, we were never sure whether we would actually be able to generate these cells and how many. We'd be very happy if a culture had 10% of cells. Then I realized that this is a common problem in stem cell biology that nearly all of us working in this field were facing. And it's an even bigger problem if you want to manufacture cells at an industrial scale. The inconsistency, complexity, and the length of the protocols means that they are very difficult to scale. So I had to look for another way, a radically new perspective on biology. Let's just consider our current situation. The reason why we're not together in a room is because the virus is hacking into our cells to produce more virus. A virus is really little more than a piece of genetic information, a program that contains a few genes. What can we learn from this? Does biology run a sort of software? And if so, can the same principles be used to reprogram cells to another cell type? In the 1980s, when scientists first figured out how to clone genes, Harold Weintraub identified a gene, a transcription factor he called MyoD, that when introduced into other cells, turned them into muscle cells. Unfortunately, this piece of research was long forgotten. Harold died an early death from brain cancer. In 2012, this concept that cells can be reprogrammed has received renewed attention when Shinya Yamanaka and John Gurdon received the Nobel Prize for showing that cells can be reprogrammed back into stem cells. This is a true revolution because it means that we can now generate stem cells from every individual and we don't need to touch any embryos with all their ethical constraints. This inspired a handful of really creative scientists and amongst these Marius Wernick in Stanford to explore whether this concept of cell reprobing can be applied to other cell types. 
he showed that it can turn skin cells into brain cells. And since then, the field has taken off and many more cell type programs have been identified. However, there was still a problem. Cell reprogramming relies on jump-starting a new cell type program by the introduction of new genes. In most cases, scientists use a virus. In our lab, we found that the cells detect the genetic material introduced by a virus and that they do everything they can to silence this new program. This means that the cells do not convert. So we had to design a different control system, a hard problem. I invested all my resource and the credibility of my group. It was really stressful at the beginning of my scientific career. It took many years of work and the help of multiple teams. And for the longest time, we were only making marginal improvements until finally, we designed a system that relies on a direct intervention at the DNA, engineering a program into what are called safe harbor sites of the cell. These are specialized areas in the DNA that are somehow protected and they allow safe activation of genes. When we tested the system and activated the first cell type program encoding human brain cells, I could not believe my eyes. Here you can see stem cells being reprogrammed into brain cells. And what is remarkable is that every stem cell in the culture seems to be turning into a brain cell at exactly the same time. And once they've reached a neuronal identity, they grow processes that connect with each other and form a neural network. And 10 days after initiating the program, the cells become functional, transmitting neural signals. This is one order of magnitude faster than traditional approaches, which often require 100 and more days. The fact that all cells turned into neurons was totally unexpected because it went against all the theories that certain cell states were required to enable reprogramming. In fact, when we submitted our manuscript for publication, it first got rejected because the reviewers did not believe the data. And this is how it works. All human cells contain the same 20,000 genes which cover all genetic programs in a cell. We can call the entirety of these programs the operating system of a cell, or life OS. At any given moment, only a subset of the genes, a subset of the genetic programs is active in a cell. The activity of these programs is controlled by transcription factors. Like code words in a programming language, these turn on networks of other transcription factors and genes. And one to six of these transcription factors encode the identity of a cell. Every cell had its unique combination. And once you know that, you can activate it and create a new cell type. Our technology enables optimized overexpression of these transcription factors in stem cells. We call it OptiOx. It relies on engineering these code words into the DNA so that they are not silenced. And whilst the entire field thought that for successful reprogramming, cells needed certain permissive states, our approach has proven that it is not the case and that all that is necessary for a deterministic change in cell identity is to control the activation of transcription factors. This technology enables fast, consistent and scalable manufacturing of cells. It's also truly a departure from the biology as we know it and represents an approach to cells that is much more like engineering. To leverage this opportunity and to develop this technology for the next generation of therapies, I became an entrepreneur and I set up a company. Our moodshot goal is to be able to generate every cell in the body. And this is why it's important. Having access to a reliable and consistent source of human cells is a game changer. A consistent source of human cells can make scientific discovery more robust. This is a big problem in biology. Experiments cannot be easily reproduced, and this has often to do with the variability between the cells used for experimentation. If scientists were able to include a standardized set of cells in their experiments, in other words, use the same cells across the globe, this would greatly reduce this problem and it would make experiments more interpretable. In order to develop a new drug, pharma companies screen millions of chemicals and so far this has not been possible in human cells. 
Drugs are therefore developed using animal models and cancer cell lines. However, let's take for example Alzheimer's. Mice don't get Alzheimer's and cell lines used for drug discovery are very different from the brain cells that the disease affects. So to generate better drugs and to do so more efficiently, we need human cells that are actually affected by Alzheimer's and that can be used in high throughput screens. Finally, what I'm most passionate about are cell therapies. If we were able to manufacture the right cells for the right conditions at scale, and perhaps even enhance their function with the knowledge that we have gained by understanding transcription factors and the programs they control, we could generate new, intelligent and curative medicines at a price point where they become accessible to everyone. We could generate immune cells that are able to dissolve brain cancers, or muscle cells that could preserve the strength in boys suffering from Duchenne's. And hopefully, one day, I will be able to inject some cells into the spinal cords of my patients and perhaps connect them to electronic devices in order to make them walk again and give them back the use of their hands. Mm -hmm.